Armand Simmons for the Los Angeles Times. The trial of George Zimmerman, a Florida neighborhood watch volunteer, accused of murdering an unarmed black teenager, neared an end on Thursday as the prosecution began to present its closing arguments. The case, which has captivated the nation, has featured multiple witnesses, compelling evidence and often testy exchanges between prosecutors and defence attorneys. A jury of six women will have to decide whether the 29-year-old Zimmerman murdered 17-year-old Trayvon Martin or shot the teenager in self-defence in February 2012. If convicted of the charge of second-degree murder, Zimmerman faces up to life in prison the judge will also allow the jury to consider a lesser charge of manslaughter. Time staff writer Tina Sussman is covering the trial in Sanford, Florida, and joins me to discuss the proceedings and the general impact of this case. Hello, Tina. Hi, Anne. So first of all, this trial has lasted uh, almost two weeks. We've heard from more than 50 uh, witnesses. Tell us about some of the most pivotal testimony. What are the memorable moments? I have to say the most memorable moment was actually one that went on for several hours, and that was the prosecution's kind of star witness, Rachel Jantel. Uh, she was captivating because she was the last person to speak to Trayvon Martin before he was shot to death uh, back in February 2012, actually just outside the housing complex where I am right now. She described the telephone conversation they had that night as he was walking back from a convenience store. He described to her that he was being followed. He got increasingly edgy. And, of course, because she was the prosecutor's key witness, the defense really went at her during an extremely long and grueling cross-examination. So I think she's the witness that most people will probably really be remembering and that the prosecution is really hoping that the jury believed wholeheartedly. Now tell us, uh, Zimmerman did not choose to testify. Why was that and what kind of impact did that have? Well, actually, according to George Zimmerman's lead defense attorney, Mark O'Mara, Mr. Zimmerman would have liked to have testified, but the lawyers, as is pretty normal in these kinds of cases, recommended that he not testify. Uh, Mr. O'Mara yesterday, after court let out, was explaining the reason for this and basically he said, look, we feel that the evidence is good enough that we really don't need George Zimmerman to stand up there and defend himself. They feel the other witnesses and the evidence has proved a good enough defense. And the other thing to remember is if George Zimmerman had gotten up on that witness stand, he would have been subject to no doubt a grueling cross-examination. So basically the defense said, hey, we just don't feel that's necessary. We've got our case. But was there critical evidence that the jury did not get to hear? Because I understand it was quite a no, you know, tough, no-nonsense judge. There's a lot of evidence that the defense wanted to have the jury hear and the prosecution objected on the issue of relevance. Now, much of that evidence it really depends on whom you ask, whether it was important evidence or not. But much of it, especially I think the most important stuff to the defense, dealt with Trayvon Martin's past, uh, his suspensions from school, for instance, and text messages and other things which apparently pointed to an interest in guns and the gangster culture. Now, the prosecution and the judge agreed that this was absolutely irre irrelevant to the case because in their mind, the case hinged on what happened that night, not on what had happened in Trayvon Martin's life in the weeks or months or even years leading up to it. And now we have, of course, closing arguments. The prosecution, I understand, is, is currently uh, uh, having its closing arguments. What kind of critical uh, moments in the closing arguments? What are the key points? Well, the prosecution, uh, Bernard de la Rienda is the, the main prosecutor, he got off to a very aggressive start. I believe his first words were, a teenager is dead. And he is clearly making a very strong effort to get this jury to remember that no matter what else they may have heard in this case, that Trayvon Martin was a 17-year-old who only had a bag of candy and a soft drink on him, and George Zimmerman was 11 years older and had a loaded weapon on him, and one of them is dead, and it's not George Zimmerman. Uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. De La Rionda did in the first hour of his opening statements, which are still going on, was to actually show the jury the, the, the plastic bags containing that bag of candy and that soft drink and almost shake it in the air just to really 
get his point across. He also showed a photograph of Trayvon Martin, uh, of his face in his casket. Uh, so he's clearly appealing to the emotions of this jury, which is, by the way, all women, which some people say could actually help the prosecution. To wrap up, Tina, I mean, that we've heard about cases of, of young black men who, say, who feel they've been discriminated against uh, or unjustly treated by, by the law. Um, why has this case had such a, a particular impact? You know, I've asked a lot of people that, uh, people who have been following it from day one, people who are not even here in Florida. And they say there was a combination of things that happened simultaneously. First of all, uh, it, 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 it invoked this uh, issue of gun laws. I mean, Florida has this rather controversial stand your ground law, which in some people's minds takes you know, self-defense to a whole new level, which they could never conceive of. You mix, so you, you had the pro and anti-gun groups kind of uh, arguing about this. You had the age of the victim, 17. That's very young by anyone's standards. You had the fact that the man with the gun was 11 years older and people thought, eh, he should have known better. Obviously, you had the racial element. Trayvon Martin was African-American. George Zimmerman is not. And I think you also had the fact that it occurred in a, a rather sleepy central Florida city. This is not Chicago, it's, it's not LA, it's not one of these big cities where unfortunately these things happen, but they tend to go unnoticed. Very This time, everybody had to pay attention. Well, thank you, Tina. It's just such a fascinating case, which will continue to follow. Thank you very much. For more on this and other stories, please go to latimes.com.